circuit evening. And once again, here we are generating our bodhicitta motivation, knowing that if you, if you have a big view of samsara, that we've been born as everything, we've done everything except practice the Dharma. And uh, we have a whole array of t-shirts from everywhere we've gone and all the fun things we've done. Yeah, Can you imagine all the t-shirts you've collected from beginningless time? You know, Disneyland and Wonder World. And, yeah, and, uh, and then all you're left with is a bunch of t-shirts and a little uh, digital thing that plays pictures of your life, even many lives, you know? So you can sit in your kind of chair and watch the pictures of your life. Is that going to be meaningful? Is that what you want to do when you're old? What use is that? So if that doesn't seem like an appetizing way to spat past your last moments in this lifetime or any lifetime, then uh, to make our lives really meaningful, bodhicitta is the way to do it. Huh? So we got to go for it, especially... I think when we have the fortune to have met the Mahayana path and the teachers and the scriptures. Because if you can imagine, you know, try this in your meditation sometime. Imagine being born somewhere with, you know, your very fervent spiritual yearning and aspiration. And there's no teachers around. And the Buddha hadn't even appeared. So there's no Dharma. There's no Sangha. And, you know, here you are with pleasure galore, but your innermost spiritual longing is is uh, totally unsatisfied. And there's nothing you can do about it. So think about that. If you were born in that kind of situation... Now, maybe you you don't have physical suffering until you get a little bit older, but the spiritual, mental suffering would really be quite quite great, I think. And then especially if you knew, wow, I spent so many lifetimes creating the karma to get this rebirth, except, and all the conditions are here, except, There's no teachers and no dharma, no place to go to learn. Yeah. So I think that would be quite, quite painful. So we want to to really make sure, you know, to generate bodhicitta while we have the chance, and then to use our bodhicitta motivation to create the causes so that in future lives we consistently have a precious human life with the eight freedoms and uh, yeah the eight freedoms and the ten fortunes okay so let's generate that motivation and make that the reason why we're listening to the teachings and uh, through that motivation then may we really take the teachings to heart because we're talking now about the um, revolving and cyclic existence, the 12 links. So this is not some uh, nice little intellectual um, thing of, you know, there's 12 things, and number one is, and number two is, and you write them all down and feed them back to a teacher on the test. But this is actually a description of our life, okay? 
And uh, for sure, we've never had anybody describe our lives like this before. You know, usually uh, how our family describes our life, maybe we get something about our, uh, you know, our physical and heredity, something like that. But that's just, you know, related on atoms and molecules and chromosome structures. And that's just... You know, who cares in the in the end? You know, but uh, here to to really think about, you know, how how am I getting reborn? Why am I why am I reborn? And why am I born here? And what is this thing called life all about? What's this purpose and meaning? Yeah, do I just kind of grow up and do what everybody else is doing and try to get as much pleasure as I can and avoid pain and and then you know you grow up you get an education you have a career you have your 2.2 children and then you get old and you get sicker and you die and yeah and then they have a grave with your name on it, beloved, whatever you were, with your name and maybe some kind of symbol yeah, that your relatives um, maybe go to every so often. And after a while, forget to go to because they die too. And then, uh, yeah. And then there's just like a tombstone and all your uh, chromosomes and stuff inside that box are all squishy and, you know, like really kind of some disgusting organic whatever in a box. Yuck. Yeah. And is that it? Is that what we're here for? Okay. And then, you know, are you going to worry about your obituary? Yeah, they better write a nice one. In fact, I really like those courses where they ask you to write your own obituary because then I'll write a really good one and I'll leave it there because uh, it'll really, it's, uh, uh, it's done out of kindness. Then they won't have to uh, put any energy into writing my bit because I'll have it all ready for them. They can just, you know, click click it and send it to the newspaper and, uh, you know, and I'll choose the picture of me, yeah, a young one, you know, when I was a lot young and attractive, not a picture of when I, like a month before I die, you know. I want, I want people to see the a nice looking one. And I'll have all my funeral things arranged beforehand. Pick the plot. Okay. You know, my mom and dad had plots right next to each other. And they're, they're very good friends. Another couple who were very good friends have plots nearby. And, uh, that lady and my mom were good friends, and, and the lady said, Oh, Adele, then we can talk to each other. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Um, you know, and uh, my sister just went, because my mom died 15 years, 14 years ago, 15 years ago recently. So my sister went to the grave and she said, Oh, there's so many weeds there. Huh? Yeah. Now, who's going to pull the weeds on your grave? Yeah. And your obit already, you know, the newspapers are after one day running it. It's, you know, whoever gets pleasure out of reading obits has finished. And yours is not going to be read again. And nobody's going to know, you know, how wonderful you are and everything you accomplished. And yeah, maybe, but like I say, you're going to have a picture when you're young. Okay. And then 
a picture of you with your corner office, and then a picture when uh, you're on vacation, yeah, drinking champagne in Acapulco or the Bahamas or somewhere. And, uh, and what else? Oh, yes, your paintings, your musical scores that you wrote, and, uh, and golf. Yeah, pictures of you golfing with your golf scores. So everybody will know what a good golfer you are. Or maybe you were a football player, yeah? Then your tombstone is even shaped like a football. Yeah? These guys, do you think, you know, in the NFL, you think they're going to have ordinary tombstones? No. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be, it's like, you know, it looks like a, a, a football with their names on it and their medals. And, yeah. And that's it. And so that's hanging around here on this planet. And uh, you don't even get to look at it because you're already reborn somewhere else. Who knows where, what else? You're born as something else. You don't remember this life. Yeah? So, so what's, what's the purpose here? What are we doing? Yeah, so this, these are very important questions, I think, that we have to really uh, look at. And uh, as we do, it spurs us to appreciate our lives and to put some energy into Dharma practice. Because what else are you going to do? Hmm. Yeah. Can you imagine these people who are like so famous, football players and movie stars and and politicians and whatever, and when they get old, all they do, all they can do is sit in front of the TV. Yeah. And then look around at pictures of when they were younger. really kind of sad. Yeah. So I think it's also good to think, what kind of old person do we want to be? Yeah, if you've spent any time near old people, some old people are really bitter. Yeah, really bitter. And some old people, you know, they're warm and, and nice and forgetful. Yeah. What was I saying? (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, what kind of old person are we going to be? Are we going to be some crotchety person who's just saying, where's my, you know, bring me my, my clicker for the TV set? Yeah. And then somebody's going to come and say, Oh, they don't have TV sets anymore. Mm-hmm. Oh, then bring me my, my, my computer. They don't have those anymore either. Well, how am I going to watch movies? Well, there's some new device. What is it? You wear glasses and the movie goes, how's that going to be right into your eyeball? I don't know. Yeah. Spider-Man coming into your eyeball? (laughs) Yuck. (laughs) So, you know? And then you have all your pills, you know? And they're they're nicely, because you have, you know, a relative of some sort who's uh, arranged all the pills. You know, the pink ones and the blue ones and how many, you know, morning, new, and night, and you're, and you're new, all your pills. And you can't remember which ones to take. And you're supposed to take them at 8 o'clock. But by 9 o'clock, you can't remember, did I take my pills this morning or not? 
because every day is so much like the last day that you can't remember. Yeah, did I take my pills this morning or was that yesterday I'm remembering taking them? Uh-huh. So, I've got to gotta prepare for these things. Yeah. So you want to be some old person who just like, yeah. you know how some old people, they complain all the time. Well, some young people do that too. <laughs> <laughs> so you develop a habit when you're young and you play it out when you're old. Yeah, you just complain about different things. Yeah. Yeah. And then at some point you begin to regret things that you've done and you want to apologize to those people, but they've died already. Huh? Or some people call you, they're dying, and they want to apologize to you, but you say, no. You think that doesn't happen? <laughs> You're not a member of my family. <laughs> yeah. This is this happens in my family. So uh, you know, think about how what kind of person you want to be this life? What kind of person you want to be next life? And then start creating the causes now. Start being that person now. Okay, so we'll take up where we took up. Yeah, last week we talked about Kyle Rittenhouse. This week we can talk about uh, Ahmed. Um, Ahmed Avery and the uh, the case for the um, what is it Unite the Right rally that one they came out with the the jury that made some decisions on that one too yeah so but um, we spent enough time on that stuff last time I think we'll work on the chapter, but really those two other decisions that came out this last week, think about them in terms of karma. Yeah? If you're a planner and an organizer of Unite the Right rally, yeah, that you may not beat anybody up, but you encourage other people to. And that creates the same karma. If you instruct somebody to do something that's either virtuous or non-virtuous, you create the same karma as if you've done it yourself. Yeah? So think about the karma those people create. And, you know, do they have regret? Or do they only regret that they got caught? Uh-huh. And then look and see, you know, when we have minds that are like that, that want to inflict harm on others, or take out our prejudices, you know, this, the way certain people look, or the way they talk, or what else, you know, whatever, how we may have certain uh, prejudices too. Or even if you're one of the groups that, that uh, you know, they were saying, you will not replace us, you know, do you create an identity out of that? Do you get angry at people? Uh, what kind of karma is that creating? What about if you're an activist and you really are doing things for justice, to create justice, but you're very angry while you're doing it? 
Yeah, then what? What karma are you creating? Okay? So this is all, we can see all of this through the perspective of the 12 links. But we have a little bit to um, go through before we get to the, the going through the 12 links. Because we stopped um, in the middle of page 158. Yeah, we went through the quotation from the Rice Seedling Sutra, which is such an incredible quotation when you really think about it. It's really quite something. So dependent arising is an abbreviation for dependent and related arising. Okay, in the context of the 12 links, dependent means that the arising of each link depends on the previous one. Okay, so each link is a result that depends on the previous link as the the principal cause. Related indicates that if one link does not exist, the next link cannot arise. So if the cause is not there, the result is not going to come. Okay? So this sounds quite simple. But when we look at our lives, yeah, do how much do we have wishful thinking? And how much do we really focus on creating the causes for what we want? Yeah? Yeah. Or do we just pray that Buddha takes care of everything, which Buddha can't do because he can't control our karma, the strength of the Buddha's... uh, Enlightened activity and the strength of our karma are equal. Yeah, so the Buddhists may be doing everything they can from their side, but if we are like an upside down bowl, no light's going to come in. Yeah, so do we really think about, you know, what we, what kind of person we want to be in the future? and then create the causes to be that kind of person now? Or do we say, yeah, I'll create the causes next week, next year? There's things that I really have to do that are so important that I really want to do. I have a bucket list that's so long. So after I get through my whole bucket list, then I'll think about what kind of person I want to be. But there's so much to enjoy in this life and so much to see and experience and all different kinds of food from different cultures and traveling different places and having adventures so I can have lots of stories to tell people. So I'll I'll, um, worry about what kind of person I'll become later. Yeah. Anyway, they say that when you die, if you just say Amitabha, what is it, ten times, he'll go to Pure Land. So that's that's you know I can do that. Yeah. If you can't remember, just say. Amitabha, in this life, when you're wide awake and sane and capable, you think you're going to remember to say it when you're dying? Yeah? And do you think ten times? Yeah, what happens if you only get eight and a half? But do you think ten times saying Namo Amitabha is going to Get you to the pure land? Okay. So, you know, how much do we really think about cause and effect? And when we have happiness, do we think this came from virtuous activities I created in the past? 
Uh You know, are we thinking? I mean, here we are, another Friday night, Saturday morning in Singapore, um, where we have the opportunity to listen to the Dharma. And did it just come out of nowhere? Yeah, we created causes. Because we could be doing a billion other things. But why are we here? What kind of causes did we put our energy into creating in the past so that we can be here right now and think about the 12 links? Yeah. And, yeah, some of you are doing Nune tomorrow. Yeah. So, yeah, all sorts of interesting things happen with Nune. Yeah, some people get stomach aches. Yeah, some people get exhausted. Some people feel elated. Yeah, if you're one of the ones who has a tummy ache, are you going to, yeah, think about what kind of thing you did in the past that's creating the cause for your stomach ache now? Or are you going to blame it all on Nune? Oh, I knew I shouldn't have done it. Yeah. Why did I volunteer to do this? Ugh, you know, next time, no, I'm not doing it. I'll stay home and eat. <laughs> yeah? It's very interesting in the prayer that you say at the end of the last se- session. It goes through all the things, like if you experience this, yeah, if you experience hunger and thirst, you're the, you know, you're purifying the karma to be born as a prata. And what kind of cause did you create? Yeah. Then read the book, Good Karma. It talks about these kinds of things. What causes? Yeah, we create it. It's in the wheel of sharp weapons. Yeah. If you had thirst, yeah, also purifying prata karma. If you're exhausted and you can't think clearly, Purifying karma to be born as an animal. Okay. And if you're in a lot of pain, purifying karma to be born in the hell realms. But you just say, yeah, this karma to be born in the hell realms, but I can't stand feeling like this. What happens if I can sneak into the house and have one glass of water? I know if I can have even half a glass of water, then I can make it through Nune. Yeah, because all my brain cells are dying. Yeah. No, uh, you think, you laugh? There was somebody when at DFF when I uh, lit a Nune there. Yeah, and this person, like the evening of the second day, just felt like, you know, she said, I, I read somewhere that when you, you, you know, you don't eat and drink, your brain cells die. And I, I just, I have to have some water. She told me this afterwards, you know. So she had some water. And she said the minute she drank some water, she felt completely okay again. But, you know, getting the water into your mouth and down your throat doesn't get it to the rest of your body. So actually, nothing actually changed in her body. But her mind felt so much better. And she broke a precept. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, you know, just really, it's a good time to think about causes and conditions and what we did, what we're experiencing, the the result of how to purify and so on. And it's so nice, I mean, when you're doing Nune and you're doing all these prostrations, yeah, think that the there's the whole sky is full of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in front of you. Yeah. Just like in the King of Prayers on every atom is a Buddha surrounded by, you know, arrays of bodhisattvas. And then around you, 
are all the sentient beings plus all your previous lives in, in, in human form, and you're all bowing together. Yeah? So create, create that kind of scene and enter it and be in that. And why not? You think that's fairy tale? Yeah, that's not reality. I'll sit here and hold my stomach and fall over. Is that reality? Yeah? The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in front of you is not reality? But your mind that's saying, I'm going to die. Yeah. And I really want to see that movie on this second afternoon, but I'm going to die first. (laughs) Yeah. And that's reality. So just, just think about, think about these things. Okay, so there is a relation between the two links. Yeah, that if one link does not exist, the other one can't arise. So each set of 12 links contains the causes and results associated with one birth. Although a complete set of 12 links may occur over two or three lifetimes. So all 12 constitute what's happening in one lifetime from creating the cause to experiencing the result to dying, okay? But all these different links can occur and usually do occur over two or three lifetimes, yeah? At least two lifetimes. If not that, then three although there's many different ways to see the uh, 12 links playing out, but we'll get to that a little later. The 12 links are ignorance, formative actions, which means karma that creates, uh, that can throw a rebirth, consciousness, name and form, six sources, okay, which means the six sense faculties, contact with an object, Feeling, our favorite one, craving. Yeah, we're really good at that one. They say love makes the world go round. In samsara, it's craving that makes the world go round. And craving's best friend, clinging. Okay. And then the uh, ninth one is renewed existence, which means the karma that's ripening for the next birth. Birth is 11, and aging or death is 12. Okay, so to fully understand each link, we need to understand its relation to both the link that precedes it and the link that follows it. The Buddha calls on us to contemplate what is the origin of each link? What is its cessation? What is the path leading to that cessation? So these questions come all the time in the Pali scriptures. You know, what is something? What is its uh, cause? What is is its cessation? What is the path to its cessation? And all of that is all about cause and effect. In explaining the forward and reverse series of causation for both samsara and liberation, the Buddha does not imply that any one link arises as a result of only the preceding link. Rather, a momentum builds up as the fa- various factors augment and reinforce one another. In short, both samsara and liberation 
depend on many interconnected causes and conditions. Okay, so when we talk about the forward, mentioned here, the forward and reverse series of causations, the forward the series for samsara starts with ignorance and goes to aging and death. Yeah, the um, reverse series starts with aging and death and then questions what caused it and you go backwards and backwards until you get to the first link. Okay, for, uh, for liberation, uh, then you start with the, the forward is when you cease ignorance, then you cease formative actions, then you cease consciousness up, up to ceasing aging and death. And the reverse there is starting with aging and death. And how do I cease that? By ceasing birth. By, and you cease that by ceasing renewed existence and so on back to ignorance. Okay. That all is going to come later, but just remember it. Okay. So how a cyclic existence occurs. When speaking of the 12 links, terminology is used in a specific way. For example, the link of ignorance refers to a specific instance of ignorance, not to all ignorance, and not to any ignorance at any time. Yeah, because we're talking about here the, the ignorance that is the cause, the initial cause of one set of 12 links, which is talking about one birth. Okay. The links of formative karma and consciousness refer to specific instances of these, not to all karma and to all consciousnesses. Because not here, formative action, the second thing, is the karma of body, speech, and mind, the action that we did that is strong enough to produce the next life. So it's not... Uh, any action that we do because neutral actions can't create a next life. Actions that don't have all four factors can't create the next life. Uh, one's actions that are weak, you know, without a strong motivation don't have the force to, to create a, a rebirth. So it's talking about specific actions, specific the the moments of consciousness, okay? Not all the types of craving and clinging described under the links of craving and clinging are instances of those two links. So if you've studied the, the 12 links before and gotten kind of confused about the way it's pre presented, yeah, anybody had that experience besides me? Um, yeah, and you read that, like there's, you know, different kinds of craving and different kinds of clinging, and but they don't all seem to fit under the link, the definition of the link of craving or the link of craving, clinging. And that's because just because something is listed there doesn't mean it's one of, it's a type of that thing. Okay? So, uh, one remember today had the, had the, a slogan, symmetry is stupid, okay? Because when you make the outlines for different things, and as we know, you know, the Tibetan Buddhism is famous for outlines and famous for lists, yeah? Just because something is listed under a certain category doesn't mean it's an instance of that category, Okay? So just because you're talking about fruit and ry a rhinoceros is listed under that category doesn't mean a rhinoceros is a kind of fruit, okay? It just means that when you're explaining fruit, there's an in interesting way to bring in a discussion of rhinoceroses or rhinoceri. I don't know what the plural is, Okay? So that's why sometimes these things can seem quite confusing. You know? Or you get a list of something. Okay, 
So in this category, there are seven subdivisions. Under the first subdivision, there are 13 other uh, categories. Yeah. Under the second subdivision, there are 10. Seven of the subdivisions of the first category are also subdivisions of the second category. Yeah. But they have different means, meanings. Okay? But the word is the same. So many things like that. So the following explanation is principally from the Sanskrit tradition and a brief explanation of the Pali tradition's perspective on a link is mentioned in cases where it differs or adds a unique perspective. But when the Pali tradition isn't mentioned specifically, what was explained here under the Sanskrit was the same thing the Pali explains. So, number one, ignorance. Yeah. So His Holiness, whenever he starts with ignorance, he says, just the word sounds inauspicious, doesn't it? Yeah. So the ignorance that is the root of samsara is beginningless. The Buddha said, a first beginning of ignorance, monastics, cannot be discerned, of w- be discerned, of which it can be said, before that there was no ignorance, and it came to be after that. Though this is so monastics, yet a specific condition of ignorance is discerned. So there is no beginning, yeah, whereby you can say, here it is, yeah, here's ignorance, but before this moment here, there was no ignorance. Yeah, why can't you say that? Because ignorance is an impermanent phenomena, which means it is caused. It is conditioned. Yeah. It arose from a cause. In the case of ignorance, it arose from a previous moment of ignorance. So you can never get to the beginning point of ignorance before which there was no cause. Because if there was no cause of ignorance in the preceding moment, then you wouldn't have the beginning of ignorance in the next moment. Getting what I'm saying? Yeah. So whether we like it or not, it's, it's beginningless. We can't trace it back. And there was nobody who created it. Yeah. If there was somebody who created it, then that person would be the cause of our misery, in which case they should be overcome. Okay. But there's no buddy, no divine identity, no pre, no uh, universal mind, no primal substance. You know, when we study Pramnavartika, remember Gishi Tapke went into all these things refuting, you know, the, all these different kinds of beliefs that people make up about how you can have a beginning to something. And all of them can be refuted. There's no possible way. Okay, so it's beginningless, but the Buddha says, yet a specific condition of ignorance is discerned. Okay, so when we're talking about the ignorance in one set of 12 links, that is a specific instance of ignorance. And it's a specific instance of a specific type of ignorance. Okay? Because there's many types of ignorance. Yeah? So it's not just some amorphous ignorance. It's the ignorance that is grasping at true existence. 
So although ignorance and cyclic existence are beginningless, in the evolution of a particular lifetime, ignorance is its initial cause. So when we say ignorance is the initial cause, it doesn't mean that ignorance had no cause. That just because it's labeled number one doesn't mean that before it existed, there was nothing, okay? There are various, very, whoops, there are various explanations of what this ignorance is. Some say it's obscurations. Others say it actively misapprehends how the person exists. Some say it observes the aggregates and conceives them to be a self-sufficient, substantially existent person. Others assert that it observes the mere eye and grasps it to be an inherently existent person. Some associate the view of a personal identity with ignorance. Others say they are unrelated mental factors. Okay, so there's a whole variety of here according to the tenant system that, that you're discussing. According to the view held in common by all tenant schools and the Pali tradition, first link ignorance is the lack of understanding of the four truths of the Aryas and of the three characteristics of conditioned phenomena, impermanence, dukkha, and not self. Okay. So these, uh, the, the three characteristics of conditioned phenomena that lead to rebirth in samsara. According to the prasangikas, so that's kind of the common general view, what they say uh, ignorance is, what ignorance is ignorant of. According to the prasangikas, it is a moment of the innate ignorance grasping the person as inherently existent that leads to rebirth in samsara. Okay, so now we're going to go into some different, the different ways that different people uh, talk about what ignorance is. So Vasubandhu and his brother Asanga and Dharmakirti assert that the false conception of the self regards the aggregates and believes them to be a self-sufficient, substantially existent person. Whereas prasangikas assert that the view of a personal identity observes the nominally existent I, which is the mere I, and grasps it to be inherently existent. Owing to the difference in their assertions about the first link ignorance, these masters have different assertions regarding what the wisdom realizing selflessness apprehends. So, so many of the different tenets in a particular tenant system depend on how they define ignorance. Yeah, as soon as the, that definition changes, Many other things in that ten tenant system change, including how they describe the path, what they, you know, what they say true cessation has ceased, and so on. Okay. Okay, so Vasubandhu and Asanga agree that the first link ignorance is an unknowing, a lack of clarity, okay? It's just obscuration. It's not grasping at anything. It's just you are in a fog, okay? However, Vasubandhu says that ignorance grasps the opposite of proper knowledge. In this case, it grasps a self-sufficient, substantially existent I, whereas a Sangha asserts that ignorance does not grasp things as existing in a way opposite to how they exist. Okay, so they're brothers, they have some similar ideas, and they also debate, quarrel. Here's a song saying, talking to Vasubana, what do you know? 
you're my basaka. Yeah. My tenant systems are higher than yours. You think the Sangha talked to Vasubandhu like that? According to Vasubandhu, ignorance is similar to seeing a coiled rope at twilight. Unable to see it clearly, we misconstrue it, misconstrue it to be a snake. Where else have you heard that example? Have you heard it before? Yeah. In what context have you heard it? Yeah. And what did it mean? Okay, we'll get to that later. (laughs) Yeah, so ignorance is like seeing a coiled rope at twilight. You can't see it clearly. That's the obscuration factor. And as Sangha says, we misconstrue it to be a snake. In the same way, due to the obscuring force of ignorance, How the aggregates exist is not clear, and we suppose them to be a self-sufficient, substantially existent person. Okay. Now I'm going to jump ahead in a minute. Here, if we take the, the Prasangika view, yeah, the Prasangikas say that, um, Here, according to Vasubandhu, the base of grasping the person is the aggregates. The aggregates are what is misconstrued. Yeah. In the Prasangika, it's the mere eye that is misconstrued. So there's a difference there. Yeah. Also, what they're misconstrued to be is different. In the lower tenant systems, they're misconstrued to be, I'm going to use the abbreviation SSSE person, and in the self-sufficient substantially existent person. And in the prasangika, they're misconstrued to be an inherently existent person. So already there's some difference. Okay. So an inherent... uh, SSSE, SSSE person, yeah, is one uh, that is, if it existed, would be one that is completely different from the aggregates. But it would still inherently exist. Okay. The prasangikas would say, yeah, a self that is completely different from the aggregates. Yeah, that also is false. That doesn't exist. Yeah, but it's the the self that does exist is not, does not exist inherently, meaning it doesn't have its own inherent nature. There's not something inside the object inside the person that makes it what it is. Okay. Rather, it's something that's merely designated in dependence on a bunch of causes and conditions and parts coming together that gives the appearance of, that just gives some appearance. And then our mind looks at that appearance and conceives that appearance to be something and then gives it a name on Okay. So it's kind of like, I I think a good example there is um, Escher. He was one of my uh, favorite things. As a kid, I had a book of his drawings. We should have one in the library, I think. We brought one, do we? Yeah, librarian, yeah. Yeah, so it's really interesting because when you first look at something, you're just seeing lines and and shapes, sometimes not even that. And then after a while, objects appear out of that. Okay? So what's printed on the page did not change. Yeah, and suddenly become the object. You know the one with the two hands that are drawing each other? Yeah. And 
what it was is our mind putting certain lines together and then saying, oh, that looks like a hand. Okay, and giving it that name. So we do that with the aggregates of a, of a person, you know. There's, well, even just labeling a person, there's a whole bunch of parts together, a whole bunch of different shapes, yeah, different qualities, hardness, softness, wetness, you know, there's smell, there's taste, there's all these different qualities. And then on that basis, we say body as a shorthand to describe an object that has all those attributes. But as soon as we say body, we forget that we're the ones who designated it, and we think that that object that is now designated appear is coming from its own side towards us. Yeah. Okay, so Vasubandhu's treasury of knowledge says, ignorance is like an enemy or a falsehood. An enemy is not just the lack of a friend, nor is it an unrelated object like a peach. It is the very opposite of a friend. Similarly, ignorance is not simply the lack of wisdom, nor is it an unrelated object. It is antithetical to wisdom. It apprehends the exact opposite of what wisdom apprehends. And this is according to Vasubandhu, as well as, as the Prasangikas. But what Vasubandhu says ignorance apprehends and what the Madhyamaka say it apprehends is different. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Vasubandhu says that because the view of a personal identity is a form of intelligence, albeit an afflictive one, it cannot be ignorance. Okay, so we're talking about two mental factors. One is ignorance, which is one of the root, six root mental factors. Then there's view of a personal identity. Yeah, the Tibetans usually call it Uh, what is it, view of the transitory collection. That name tells you a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, view of a transitory, or view of the perishing aggregates. That tells you something a little bit better than view of a transitory collection. Yeah, because view of a transitory collection, I mean, that's the table too, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so these are view of a trans uh, <laughs> view of a personal identity is one type of afflictive view. Afflictive view as a category is one of the root afflictions. We went th- through that earlier in this volume. Okay, so. Um, and what's interesting about view of a, tra- of a um, personal identity is it's called an intelligence. Some of the other wrong views are called, or afflictive views are also called intelligences. But view of a personal identity is very stupid. It grasps the person to exist in the opposite way than it actually exists. So why is it called intelligence? Okay, so it's intelligent because it analyzes the object. Yeah, but it analyzed it wrong. So we get things like this. It, it, It can be confusing if you don't understand that intelligence in Buddhism doesn't mean you're smart. It, yeah. I mean, in some conditions, it means you're smart, but in some conditions, like the view of a, trans, of, of a personal identity, it's the intelligence comes 
up with the wrong conclusion, okay? So ignorance does not analyze according to this view, but uh, Sangha, um, Vasubandhu, but um, view of a personal aggregate uh, of a personal identity does, so they cannot be the same thing, okay? They're two distinct mental factors. And innate affliction, ignorance is, is overcome only on the path of meditation, while the view of, of personal identity is eliminated on the path of seeing. So that's showing that the, um, the view of a personal identity is seen as an acquired affliction or as something that's not so intense, yeah, as ignorance is. Okay. Now, of course, prasangika is very different here. Okay. The primary mental consciousness that is accompanied by both ignorance and view of a personal identity has one facet that does not know the object accurately, that's ignorance, while simultaneously another facet apprehends the aggregates in a distorted manner and grasps them to be a self-sufficient, substantially existent person. That part is the view of a personal identity. Okay, so they both exist in the same uh, mental event, according to Vasubandhu. Asanga, his brother, says that ignorance is like darkness that obscures seeing reality. It does not grasp the aggregates as existing in a contrary way, whereas view of a personal identity does. Okay. For this reason, he says, view of a personal identity is not ignorance. Yeah. So he's going to say that, you know, uh, Vasubandhu is kind of merging them, but still saying they're different. They're merged in the sense of being in the same mental event, but they're different things. Yeah. And Asanga is really saying, I think, here, that they're different in different mental events. So he agrees that the view of a personal identity is a form of afflictive intelligence, but he does not accept it as the mental factor of intelligence because intelligence must necessarily be virtuous and the view of a personal identity is neutral. Okay, so Vasubandhu says, you can have virtuous and non-virtuous intelligences depending on how you're analyzing the object. Uh, but a Sangha says if it's intelligence, it has to be virtuous. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is a whole thing. I think regarding uh, the eight, not, not, not the five omnipresent, the five object ascertaining that I think um, some people say it, uh, they all have to be virtuous. I think that's a Sangha. And Vasubandhu says those five can be virtuous or non-virtuous. So those five include, um, let's see if we can come up with them. What are they? Aspiration, uh, belief, mindfulness, concentration, and, and share of wisdom or intelligence. Yeah. So Dharmakirti says that the opposite of the wisdom realizing selflessness is the view of a personal identity, which he identifies with ignorance. Okay, so he's saying very clearly here it's the opposite of the realization of selflessness. So, the, you know, this first uh, link, ignorance, it's not the ignorance that doesn't understand karma. Yeah, if we create uh, negative karma, such that the second link is negative, then there was also the link of, of uh, then also the ignorance 
was present. The ignorance that doesn't understand karma properly was also present when we created that that karma. Okay. Uh, so ignorance, according to Dharma Kirti, uh, observes the five aggregates and grasps them to be a self-sufficient, substantial existent person. Okay. And then here's a quote. Oh, these are from Geshe. The first one's from Geshe Sopa. The second one's from Chim Jampa Yang, who is a Tibetan who wrote the main Abhidharma commentary that the Tibetans use. So the first quote is, Here the antidote wisdom is understanding the truth, the meaning of the selflessness of persons. Its opposite is the view of a personal identity, which grasps a self of persons. And for these, you know, Dharma Kirti and the others too, it's also uh, the ignorance that doesn't understand the four truths. Uh, remember, you got to put that in the equation. Then the second uh, quote from Chim Jampa Yang is, all faults without exception arise from the afflictive view of self. That is ignorance. So here he's making the afflictive view of self being the same as ignorance. So you can see there's a lot of different opinions. Okay? According to Prasangikas, the view of a personal identity and ignorance both grasp their object as existing inherently. And for that reason, the view of a personal identity is a form of ignorance. So Prasangika has put them together. Okay. But still, ignorance is much broader than view of a personal identity. Because when you just talk about ignorance, the mental factor of in- ignorance, it includes ignorance of karma and all sorts of other kinds of ignorance, whereas view of a personal identity doesn't include that. So first link ignorance is the view of a personal identity. It is an innate self-grasping that has been present since beginning this time and gives rise to formative karma that projects a rebirth in cyclic existence. Okay, so it's very clear. It's the moment of ignorance that's going to create that karma that is going that and that karma that is going to be strong enough to produce a rebirth. Okay, it is not acquired self grasping that is due to familiarity with incorrect philosophies, nor is it the mental factor of ignorance, which is much broader and includes ignorance regarding karma and its effects. Okay, so first link ignorance is not the same as the mental factor of ignorance. It only has the qualities of part of the mental factor of ignorance and is referring to a very specific instance. Ignorance grasps the inherent existence of persons and phenomena, whereas the view of a personal identity grasps the inherent existence of only our own I and mine. Okay? So here's three things we've got to keep separate. Okay? Uh, Grasping uh, the self of persons, grasping the self of phenomena, and uh, view of the, uh, <laughs> I keep on wanting to say transitory collection of the view of the personal identity. Okay. So, and here also when we say self, you know, self-grasping of the self-grasping of aggregates, self there doesn't mean person. It means uh, inherent existence. So self has two meanings. One is the person, which exists. The second is inherent existence, which doesn't exist. 
And it's up to you when you read the text and it says self to figure out which one they're talking about. Okay, so whenever we say self-grasping or self of person, self of aggregates or selflessness in those uh, situations, the self means inherent existence according to the, the prasangikas, okay? When you say uh, ignorance, exe- ignorance grasps, or a um, uh, view of a personal identity grasps the, the self to be inherently existent, in that case, self means person. It's grasping the person to be inherently existent, okay? So, okay, so you have self, you have the, the, Self-grasping of the aggregates that arises first, that grasp the aggregates as inherently or truly existent. It produces the grasping of the person, okay? The, which is also the ignorance grasping the person and this, and the view of the personal identity grasping them. No, it doesn't include it. It is the ignorance grasping the the person to be inherently existent, okay? The ignorance grasping the person to be inherently existent has two two branches. One is the ignorance uh, grasping you, you, yourself, to be inherently existent. That one is the view of the personal identity. The other one, yeah, is grasping everybody else that you see as being inherently existent. Okay, is that clear? Yes. Yeah, it's, you can just draw it in a little picture, okay? Ignorance, two branches, yeah, grasping the, the, the phenomena, the aggregates as truly existent, Grasping the person is truly existent. That one has two branches. One that is the view of the create um, trans- God, view of the personal identity, which refers to yourself, and then the other branch is grasping all other sentient beings as inherently existent. Okay, you can draw a a um, maybe a diagram, <laughs> a spreadsheet. Yeah. But really, drawing diagrams of this kind of stuff is very, very helpful. You know, the ex- explanation sometimes gets confusing, but when you just draw it, it's very clear. Okay. So, uh, this ignorance that we're talking about here is an innate ignorance, which means that it came uh, to, we have it, from previous lives. It's the beginningless one. It's not an acquired gra- self-grasping that is due to familiarity with incorrect philosophies. So that's if you, you know, you take, a, uh, you go to Sunday school and you learn there's a soul. Yeah. That is an acquired ignorance. Yeah. And this ignorance also, um, is, nor is the mental factor of ignorance uh, so this this first first link ignorance, okay, it's not an acquired self grasping, and it is not, nor is the mental factor. That's how does the sentence read? It is not acquired self grasping that is due to familiarity with incorrect philosophy, nor is it the mental factor of ignorance which is much broader and includes ignorance regarding karma and its effects. Okay, so the sentence was written correctly. I found another boo-boo later on, though. We'll come to it. Ignorance grasps the inherent existence of persons and phenomena, whereas the view of a personal identity grasps the inherent existence of only our own I and mine. Okay. All beings except arhats, bodhisattvas on the eighth ground or higher, 
Those are called pure ground bodhisattvas. Yeah, and they've eliminated the afflictive obscurations. Yeah, so all beings except arhats, bodhisattvas on the eighth ground are higher, and Buddhas have ignorance. But only ordinary beings, those below the path of seeing, have first link ignorance. Okay, so you could be um, a bodhisattva on the second ground. You're an Arya. You still have ignorance, yeah, because you still have innate ignorance. But that ignorance is not considered first link ignorance because you've realized emptiness so that ignorance is not strong enough to create the karma that is going to uh, propel another rebirth. Got it? Yeah. Okay. Aryas of the three vehicles who have not eradicated all afflictive obscurations have ignorance. However, it is not strong enough to produce karma that projects a samsaric rebirth, and thus it is not first link ignorance. Okay. Although, yeah, when you have a stream enterer, a stream enterer can be reborn in the desire realm. Their path of seeing... And if they can be reborn in the desire realm, they must have a kind of ignorance that can project uh, a rebirth. Did you say that bodhisattva is on the second ground? No, I said if you are a bodhisattva on the second ground, Mm -hmm. you still have ignorance, Mm -hmm. but your ignorance isn't strong enough to propel another rebirth in samsara. But they st- yeah, but it's still okay. But it's still classified as first thinking ignorance. No, it's not a. It's not an illustration of first link ignorance. Okay, because this sentence says bodhisattvas only bodhisattvas on the eighth ground or higher don't, don't have first link ignorance. Okay, I'm confused. It's okay. It's okay. Hmm. Um, no, they, they. Okay, before. Okay, but only ordinary beings, those below the path of seeing, have first link ignorance. Okay, but they have that ignorance, but it's, they can't, it's not the first link ignorance. I mean, the, the, for the ordinary beings, they have the ignorance, and it's the ignorance that can propel a rebirth. Once you get to the the path of seeing, at least for the bodhisattvas, it can't propel a samsaric rebirth. Yeah. But it's interesting because for stream enters, yeah, and once returners, it can. Yeah. So somehow they got left out here. Mm -hmm. Do you want to make a note of that? We should add another sentence here. I'm wondering if if this means that um, someone past the path of seeing doesn't have first link ignorance, but they could still generate craving and clinging. Is that how they could be projected into another rebirth from a past karma they created prior to path of seeing? Um, At least for the bodhisattvas, yeah. And it it depends here. Uh, This is in volume six. It depends here uh, whether there's different bodhisattvas that have irreversibility and not. There's different, even on the same ground, there's differences among the, the bodhisattvas. Okay, but very often it, they say if a bodhisattva is at this uh, a certain level, then they quote quote take rebirth in samsara, which means that that rebirth is projected by the um, latencies of ignorance, not by ignorance, but by the latencies of ignorance, and. Uh, 
unpolluted karma. Okay? So they still may appear, those bodhisattvas appear in samsara, but they're not, it's not by the force of the 12 links as we, as ordinary beings go through it. Yeah? But for the, for the fundamental vehicle, the stream enterers, yeah, I mean, they're born in the desire realm and can be reborn in the, um, yeah. So something's going on there. They still have the first link ignorance. Yeah, because they don't have the ability to control their rebirth. The, those um, uh, stream enters are at the path of seeing in the... Uh, in the the vehicle of the the shravaka vehicle okay so they have the same realization of emptiness as the bodhisattvas on the bodhisattva the bodhisattva path of seeing in sen- in the sense that both of them realize emptiness directly but the bodhisattva's path of seeing is much more powerful than the shravaka path of seeing, because the bodhisattvas have the force of all this merit that they've been creating. Yeah, because by the time you get to the the first bumi, I mean the the path of seeing, you've you have one great eon of merit accumulated. Then on the first seven grounds, you get another great eon. And then from the eighth, ninth, and tenth is the third gradient. So, oh, it's not just gradient; it's countless gradients, because they they uh, they spend three countless gradients creating there. But whereas, you know, fundamental vehicle practitioners don't do that. Yeah. So the, you know, their their wisdom isn't powerful enough to to eliminate things at the same time as it, for, as it is for the bodhisattvas. Okay. I know this is like a lot of names and terms and you're going, well, who, how, and what's realized what? And it gets clear. You hear it enough times and you begin to have an idea of how it all fits together. So if it's not totally clear now, that's okay. Yeah, but try and remember at least the names and then, you know, go back and try and fit it all together. And if you get confused, look at part two of volume six. (laughs) Okay. Okay, so Arya's of the three vehicles who have not eradicated all afflictive obscurations have ignorance. However, it should say here, for the bodhisattvas, it is not strong enough to produce karma that projects a samsaric rebirth, and thus it is not first link ignorance. Okay, got it. So first link ignorance is the specific moments of ignorance grasping inherent existence and the view of a personal identity that lie behind the motivation, performance, and completion of a virtuous or non-virtuous karma that is powerful enough to project a rebirth in samsara. It is not other moments of ignorance or other types of ignorance that occur in our lives. In short, first link ignorance is the view of a personal identity that newly motivates its, meaning that ignorance's, own set of 12 links that motivates its second branch formative action. This ignorance actively grasps the self as existing in a way it does not. It is the root of samsara, the principal cause of rebirth and cyclic existence, according to the Prasagikas. The notion of grasping inherent existence may seem abstract to us at first, but it is our frequent experience. It sounds like just some kind of intellectual conception right now, but it's going on all the time, okay? 
when intense craving or even moderate craving <laughs> or even a little bit of craving <laughs> arises in us, the I appears to be independent of all other factors and we apprehend it as existing in this way. I must have this. Yeah? Has that uh, thought gone through your mind today? I must have this. I don't like that. This is too much for me. Yeah? Okay. When anger rules our minds, the self appears very solid, as if it existed under its own power. That disturbs me. That me isn't some kind of whimsy me. It's me, you know, a real inherently existent one that has the force of its own essence, independent of everything else. And it's calling the shots. Yeah, I don't like this and I want that. And don't look at me that way. I am so-and-so. What is it the Wizard of Oz said? I, when, it be, when he was behind the curtain, I am the great Wizard of Oz. Something, yeah. Remember that statement? He made it so clearly. I am the Wizard. The great Wizard of Oz. And then Toto pulls back the curtain. <laughs> and there's just some old man there. Yeah. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, but that's so much like our ignorance. It makes this big production. But when you look at what it is, there's nothing there to have a production about. Yeah. That movie has a lot of wisdom in it. <laughs> yeah? Uh. Okay, the eye seems to be somewhere within, within our bodies and minds, but also separate from them. Okay, so it has a very contradictory feeling. It's somewhere in there, but it's not exactly the same as the body and mind either. Okay. So this grasping is a troublemaker. It instigates and empowers afflictions that create karma, which ripen in lower rebirths. It also instigates polluted virtuous motivations, which bring higher rebirths, but still keep us bound in samsara. It is a false view, because when we examine how the I exists, we see it is not our minds, our bodies, the collection of body and mind, or something apart from them. The I exists by mere designation. Mere designation. Yeah. Just by concept and, and name. Do you think you exist just by concept and name? That there's nothing you there? Is that your feeling about yourself? No, there's, a, there's me here, isn't it? Totally an independent me. And we're sure of it. And we defend it. And it runs our lives. And it's something that is, there's nothing there that is the I. There's only an appearance due to a, a name and a concept. There's nothing you can point to that is you. Yeah. That makes you a little bit nervous. Yeah, if it makes you a little bit nervous, it's having an effect. If it doesn't make you nervous, then we're, we're too ignorant to get it. <laughs> really, you know, I mean, we're so ignorant that we don't even realize we're ignorant. 
So, you know, that's why it, it takes a while to remove this. Okay, so we'll stop here. Wow, we did four pages. But there's a lot in those four pages, huh? Okay. <laughs>